return to Butler. Donald Trump rallies in Pennsylvania at the site of the July assassination attempt. And if we win Pennsylvania, we will win the whole thing. I'm Caitlin Huey Burns, and thousands have turned out to cheer on the former president as he returns here to Butler just a month before Election Day. Also tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris heads to North Carolina in the wake of Hurricane Helene. We're going to be getting substantial resources in to help folks. The latest on relief efforts and the rush to help. I'm Janet Shamley in Morganton, North Carolina, where volunteers from all over the country are here helping people clean this stuff up. Even Dolly Parton anyway. pitching in. Hilly, hilly, hilly. Plus, the new weather threat churning towards Florida. Israel strikes Lebanon, expanding its attacks. I'm Yuki Ostaev in Beirut, where more than 1.2 million people across Lebanon have been displaced in the violence. Thousands today worldwide joining pro-Palestinian protests. In Oakland, California, a rabbi's new reality after the Hamas attack. CBS's Itai Had with our Weekend Journal. And later, healing light. After the school shooting, the Appalachian High School football team returns to home field for the very first time. This game right here is uh, a symbol of strength. This is the CBS Weekend News from New York with Jerika Duncan. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin in Butler, Pennsylvania, a small rural community an hour outside Pittsburgh where supporters who watched former President Donald Trump get shot welcomed him back. The attack at the town's fairgrounds in July killed a man and wounded two others. Well, tonight, Trump returned to the same stage, but under very different political circumstances. Then President Biden was his opponent, and Trump was coming off of a dominating debate performance and was leading in the national polls. Well, now he faces Vice President Kamala Harris and a race that is neck and neck. CBS's Caitlin Huey Burns is in Butler, where Trump began with a unifying message. Caitlin, good evening to you. Good evening, Jerico. Well, thousands of people, including those from around the country, came here to Butler to see the former president's return. And while the scene behind me may look similar to that rally that day in July, the state of the race and the level of security has all changed. As I was saying, former President Donald Trump returned to Butler, Pennsylvania with a message. So 12 weeks ago, we all took a bullet for America, and all we are all asking is that everyone goes out and vote. And all of this will be for nothing if you don't get out and vote. Trump and the crowd paid tribute to Cory Comparator, a supporter who lost his life that day, shielding his family from the bullets. His seat in the crowd was marked by his firefighter uniform. Saturday's rally was set up to be almost identical to the one in July, complete with a large American flag blowing over the crowd, but with notable security exceptions. The U.S. Secret Service expanded the security perimeter and stationed personnel on the roof of the shed from where the shooter fired. Snipers stood atop a row of trailers put in place to block the line of sight from that shed to the stage. Rob Hunt was standing just 25 yards away from the stage that day in July and returned today. If he was uh, willing to come back to where he was shot, um, I I'm willing to come back. What does it mean to you? that he's returning to this place. It means that, hey, he's a fighter and he's, he's going to fight for us. And with just one month to go before Election Day, Trump is fighting for his political life, tied with Vice President Kamala Harris in the key battleground state of Pennsylvania. And today's rally is not only symbolic, it's also one of necessity. The election is just one month from today, and Pennsylvania has the most electoral votes to offer out of all of the battleground states. Jerika? Important to note that. Caitlin Huey Burns in Butler, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Today, the Democratic nominee, Vice President Kamala Harris, headed to North Carolina to survey the devastation from Hurricane Helene. Harris praised the work of strangers helping strangers, pledging ongoing federal support. Federal assistance for these um, issues is, I know, extremely important because a lot of folks don't save for these kinds of emergencies, and when they hit, 
um, it takes a real drain on their resources and ability to take care of themselves and their family. This was Harris's second trip in just four days to the disaster zone. The storm's death toll is now at at least 229 across six states, but many people remain unaccounted for with their families desperate for answers, and the search for them is complicated. Janet Shamlian is in the battered community of Morganton, North Carolina, with more on that part of the story. Janet. Good evening. There is so much suffering here tonight, Jerika. This tragedy now entering its second week, it's hard to overstate the vastness of the devastation. It's, it's just heartbreaking, guys, I'm telling you. Floodwaters took everything from Alvin Stiles except his faith in humanity. These are toilet trees, toothbrushes, a deodorant soap, washcloths. All, right. All right, we can always use that stuff. His home in Morgantown, North Carolina, destroyed. Styles sleeps in a tent. Even amid unimaginable loss, he's lifted by kindness. What's that like when people you don't know show up? I, I didn't know there was as many people that care about people like they've been caring here today and yesterday for us. It's just been overwhelming. This is the story across a weary storm zone. The ugly business of cleaning up, the beautiful gifts, volunteering and donations, including a big one, a million dollars from Tennessee's own Dolly Parton. I mean, who knew in our little part of the country here, where I was born and raised, just right down the road, that we would have this kind of devastation. The impact now felt across the country. The closure of a North Carolina medical manufacturer has several hospitals dealing with IV fluid shortages. And General Motors stopped production of plants in Texas and Michigan because it can't get parts from storm impacted suppliers. From supplies delivered by helicopter to water and food deliveries made by mule, resources from across the country heading to those hardest hit. We spent Saturday morning at Asheville High School where a hot breakfast was served and where those in need and those helping to fulfill the need were frequently one and the same. There's no reason to hold my head down. God is still in the work and business and I'm blessed to be here. With power slowly being restored, the bigger issue tonight is running water. Tens of thousands are without it. In Jerica, many people are being told it will be at least four weeks before it's running again. Man, our prayers to the communities that have been impacted. Janet, thank you so much. Today, around the globe, there were demonstrations ahead of the one-year mark of the Hamas attack on Israel and the war in Gaza that has followed. Tens of thousands showed up in several cities, most in support of the Palestinians in Gaza. But in Rome, protesters clashed with police. Water cannons and tear gas were used to disperse the crowd. Well, tonight, Israel launched new punishing airstrikes at targets in Beirut, huge explosions hitting the city. This as the head of the U.S. Central Command arrived in Israel as the war widens. CBS's MTS Tayeb is in the Lebanese capital with the very latest. MTS. Good evening. Israel's bombing campaign across Lebanon is expanding tonight. For the first time, the country's north has been targeted, killing a member of Hamas, not Hezbollah, as strikes elsewhere intensify. Dressed in black and wearing emerald-colored headbands, the colors of Hamas. This is the funeral of Saeed Atala, a commander for the militant group's Qassam brigades, along with his wife and two daughters who were killed in the Israeli strike. But it's Hezbollah Israel says it's after, as it ramps up its bombing campaign across Lebanon, leveling entire buildings. Like this one, one week ago, Israeli fighter jets targeted this building in the predominantly Christian village of Ain al-Delb. It was full of people who had fled the fighting further south. At least 60 people were killed, according to Lebanese health officials. Well, this was once a five-story building, and as you can see, it's now just a mountain of rubble. All that's left of what was once people's lives, just bits of clothing and dust. One shoe a pair of jeans, and a family picture. Relics of lives that no longer exist. In the shadow of Beirut's iconic blue mosque, more displaced families are living out in the open, including Syrian refugee Mohammed Ahmed Al-Naim and his family. 
part of the 1.2 million across Lebanon who've abandoned their homes for safety. We had to flee one war only to find another war, he says. This is torture. At just 20 days old, baby Rita is among the youngest displaced. She and her mother Fatima shelter in this classroom crammed with personal belongings. A new life amid so much violence. And tonight, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is lashing out against France's President Emmanuel Macron after he called for a ban on weapons shipments to Israel, Jerika, with Macron saying Lebanon cannot become another Gaza. MTS Tayeb reporting in Beirut. Thank you. To the weather now, relentless and historic autumn heat is blasting the western part of the United States with alerts in effect for about 30 million people in parts of California, Arizona, and Nevada. For more on that, let's check in with our CBS meteorologist, Andrew Kozak. Good evening, Jerico. We're going to start in the west tonight, where dangerous heat continues for areas just west of Los Angeles, San Diego, and then all the way up to San Francisco. Could feel as hot as 115 for areas once again like Phoenix, continuing to set record highs. A little further inland, we have an excessive heat watch. This is going to continue for Fresno and Bakersfield. Through the beginning of next week, it could feel as hot as 103. Believe it or not, since October 1st and the month just began, over 125 record highs have been broken. Now to a developing situation. Tropical storm Milton already starting to develop now on the west side of the Gulf of Mexico. It's a weak tropical storm, but it's going to quickly intensify to a two, if not a category three hurricane by Tuesday into Wednesday. And unfortunately for Florida, which is still cleaning up after Helene, this could give us an additional 10 to 12 inches of rain. Jerika, this is going to be something we watch very carefully over the course of the next 24 hours. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. Straight ahead, reporter's notebook. We look back at one year since the deadly October 7th attack in Israel. Monday marks one year since the Hamas-led terrorist attacks on Israel. 1,200 people were killed, at least 251 others taken hostage. Our Charlie Daggett reported extensively on the attack and the war in Gaza that followed. In this reporter's notebook, he recalls the massacre and escalating regional conflict. For all the turmoil, suffering, and heartbreaking loss of life that has unfolded since, the massacre on the morning of October 7th is when it began. When heavily armed Hamas gunmen slaughtered nearly 1,200 people. More than 40 Americans among them. Rampaging the Nova Music Festival, storming kibbutz after kibbutz, the small rural communities dotted within easy reach of Gaza. They saw At the Kafar Azah kibbutz, we walked through the burnt out ruins that told the story of the horrors the that had taken place. He... You can still see the beast here. The bodies of Hamas terrorists still lying where they fell. 66 residents found dead on this street alone. Some of the children tried to hide behind these bushes, and they found them, and they slaughtered them, and they were happy. More than 250 people abducted, including Californian Hirsch Goldberg Poland, who lost his arm to a Hamas grenade and ultimately lost his life at the hands of his captors just over one month ago. Finally, my sweet boy, finally, 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 you're free. In the weeks after Israel's ground invasion of Gaza, we were able to join soldiers of the Israel Defense Forces. He showed us what he said was a launch pad for Hamas missiles positioned right next to a family swimming pool. What we didn't see was any Palestinian civilians dead or alive. Israel has largely prevented foreign journalists from reporting inside Gaza. For CBS News, that reporting fell to the courageous work of producer Marwan Al Ghul, who has risked his life covering this story. I found a lot of children, women, all suffer of cold. No enough food, no enough water, no clothes. Marwan has lost several friends and family members, adding to a death toll that has surpassed 41,000 and still climbing by the day. As Israel's war has widened, the relationship with its strongest ally has become more strained. 
Pentagon officials tell us they were not warned in advance of that pager attack on Hezbollah fighters, nor the assassination of Hamas and Hezbollah leaders, including Hassan Nasrallah himself. Part of Iran's justification for the largest ballistic missile attack Israel has ever seen. U.S. destroyers helped thwart that attack, and officials tell CBS News that heavy U.S. presence will remain in the region for the foreseeable future. Charlie Daggett, CBS News at the Pentagon. Thank you, Charlie. Still ahead on the CBS Weekend News, new reality, what some American synagogues are doing to keep their Depending congregants safe. The FBI and Department of Homeland Security are warning of potentially violent attacks on Jews and Arabs as we approach the one-year mark of the Hamas attack on Israel. In tonight's Weekend Journal, CBS's Itai Had reports many in the Jewish communities are already on high alert. Last year, Rabbi Mark Bloom's biggest worry was finding enough chairs for the high holidays. This year, it's making sure every door is locked twice. This past year has undoubtedly been the most challenging I've ever had to face as a rabbi. With the anniversary of the October 7th Hamas attack coinciding with Judaism's holiest days, anxiety at Temple Beth Abraham in Oakland, California is at an all-time high. It's in the forefront of my head. Congregant Ilan Matslia says the events of October 7th shattered his sense of safety. I have nightmares about it. I think it's changed the relationships I have with people. For the anniversary, Rabbi Bloom is increasing security, adding extra guards with additional support from the city's police department. Across the nation, synagogues are responding similarly as anti-Semitic incidents surged 63% in 2023. Raphael Brenner is a counterterrorism analyst for the Bay Area Jewish Federation, which oversees security for Jewish institutions in Northern California. He says the recent attack by Iran on Israel has added a new layer of unpredictability to an already precarious situation. I think the key thing that October 7th changed was the realm of the possible started to seem like the realm of the probable. Blessed are you, God, who spreads the... For Rabbi Bloom, it's about reminding people that even amidst all the sorrow and fear, there is at least one silver lining. It really has brought our community together. Now, he hopes his sermon strikes the right chord, keeping congregants' hearts wide open and the doors looks good. firmly closed. Itai Had, CBS News, Oakland, California. Next on the CBS Weekend News, up, up, and away, we head to New Mexico for the world's largest festival of balloons. Today, the sky over Albuquerque, New Mexico, was filled with balloons of all colors. It is day one of the 52nd International Balloon Fiesta, the world's largest ballooning event. All kinds of hot air balloons will take to the skies, including racer, special shaped and remote controlled balloons. The fiesta runs through October 13th. And another reason to look up at the sky, the northern lights, also known as Aurora Borealis, will be visible to people in the northern states this weekend due to a recent eruption of material from the sun. The best time to see them, according to the Space Weather Prediction Center, at night between 10 and 2, and of course, away from city lights. Coming up next, we head to Winder, Georgia, where high school football is helping a traumatized community cope with a devastating loss. Finally tonight, we visit a community 45 miles northeast of Atlanta, working to gain a sense of normalcy. Life changed forever at Appalachie High School when a gunman opened fire. Well, recently, under the bright Friday night lights, the focus was on more than just football as the team hosted its first home game of the season. These are cheers of triumph. Last night in Georgia, the Appalachian High School Wildcats charged the field against Jackson County, many wearing T-shirts declaring they are Chi Strong. This game right here is uh, a symbol of strength. 
Friday's game was just one month after a mass shooting devastated this community. I think today is like the day that like we can all like, as I say, reclaim our school. Of the 13 people shot, four died, including two students and two teachers. One was a defensive football coach, Richard Aspinwall. A 14-year-old student is charged with the shootings. His father is also accused of manslaughter and other crimes for gifting his son the AR-style rifle used in the attacks. Friday's game was about much more than the gridiron. It was about moving forward and finding peace. Um, I think it's very important to show that we're able to get back up again. And as the local sheriff said that terrible day, love will prevail. Well, that is the CBS Weekend News for this Saturday. I'm Jerika Duncan in New York. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.